Is man playing dice with the universe? And if he is, is it safe? When he knocks at the door of the unseen world, who answers that knock? Who originates the strange messages that type themselves without human guidance on a best-selling author's typewriter? Who relates the latest spirit world gossip? Is somebody running an answering service for the dead? Man is tossing balls across the wall of the unseen world, and somebody is tossing them back. Who? And is it dangerous? We intend to find out. It is written. This is George Vandam. Today, It Is Written presents Playing Games with the Unseen World. Bishop James A. Pike didn't believe in life after death, so he said. But his convictions were rather easily uprooted. In fact, he seemed to be drawn like a magnet into the realm of the occult. It was the suicide of his son Jim on February 4, 1966 that triggered it all. Just before Jim took his life in a New York City hotel room, he had spent several, uh, several months with his father in Cambridge, England. This had been a happy experience for both father and son, and of course Jim's sudden death brought great sorrow to Bishop Pike. Soon after Bishop, uh, Jim's body had been cremated, Bishop Pike returned to the same Cambridge apartment that he'd occupied with his son. David Barr, the bishop's chaplain, and Marin Burgrud, a secretary, shared the flat with him. Then things began to happen. And the incredible thing about these phenomena was that all of them were in some way reminiscent of young Jim. For instance, Jim, while he lived, was always buying postcards of the places he visited. Though he seldom mailed them, now without explanation, two of these postcards appeared in front of the nightstand in the bishop's bedroom. They were placed at a 140 degree angle. Naturally, they thought of Jim. Two days later, Marin Burgrud appeared at breakfast with a section of her bangs burned off, as if they were cut with scissors. Jim had not liked her bangs. The next morning, the rest of her bangs were gone. The following day, in front of the bishop's nightstand, where they had found the postcards, were now two books. They were placed at the same 140 degree angle. Then Marin noticed that two photos of Jim and his father had disappeared from the bishop's mirror. David Barr searched the living room, and as he did, he noticed that the clock on the bookshelf read 819. It had been stopped at 1215 for weeks. Now the hands formed the same 140 degree angle as the postcards in the books. Could this be the Cambridge time for Jim's death in New York? None of the three believed in life after death, but now they were confronted with a rash of apparent evidence. Venetian blinds closed as Jim would have closed them. The heat turned up as he liked it. Closed windows open, books move, safety pins scattered about. A broken cigarette in front of the nightstand, Jim's brand. A mirror slid off a closet shelf as Merrin watched. A lock of singed blonde hair, clearly hers, turned up in front of the nightstand. And to top it off, open safety pins in the bathroom were found arranged in the same familiar 140 degree angle. They decided that evidently death did not end at all. What should they do? The bishop sought counsel from Canon John Pierce Higgins of London, was advised to make an appointment for a seance with a famous British medium, Ina Twig. At the seance, Bishop Pike was sure that he felt Jim's presence. A second sitting followed. The bishop asked for the name of a good medium in America that he might contact when he arrived at home. In a twig, while in a trance, mentioned spiritual frontiers. Now this meant nothing at the time to either the bishop or the medium. But 
Several weeks after returning to the United States, Bishop Pike was preaching in New York City. At the conclusion of one service, a stranger asked to speak to him. He told him that he had seen two figures behind him in the pulpit as he spoke. One of them, he said, was a tall young man named Jim. The other was a patriarchal figure named Elias. Now, how did this stranger know that Jim's maternal grandfather was named Elias? Well, the stranger turned out to be Arthur Ford of Spiritual Frontiers, who was to figure so prominently in the bishop's life. As you remember, Arthur Ford, you recall, was the medium who conducted the much-publicized seance from Toronto in which the bishop supposedly talked with his son. Bishop Pike lost his life, of course, you remember, in the Jordanian desert. And as for Arthur Ford, this best known of American mediums died of a heart attack on January 4, 1971. But it appears that the story of neither man ended with his death. While the bishop's wife, Diane, was waiting in Jerusalem at the hotel, she was waiting for word of her husband. She had a vision. She says that she saw her husband leave his body in a filmy, cloud-like substance. She saw it slowly rise up between the rocks toward the brim of the canyon. She could tell he was smiling, she said. She saw her husband ascend to heaven where he was greeted by his son Jim and his old friend Paul Tillich. As for Arthur Ford, it appears that he didn't waste any time once he was dead. In fact, before the day was out, he'd sent word back from the other side, and the next morning he was on the line himself, the typewriter line, that is. Hardly were his ashes scattered over the Atlantic when he began dictating a book that was destined to become a bestseller. So the, earth, the book's earthbound author says, Ruth Montgomery. The book claims to be an inside, first-hand eyewitness account of what the afterlife is like. And its phenomenal sale is evidence of man's curiosity about the other side of death. Evidently, everybody wants to know. Now, Ruth Montgomery says that she did not write the book, that Arthur Ford did. She only placed the type paper in the typewriter and her fingers in touch position. Arthur Ford did the rest, she says, from the other side. Well, something's going on. There's no doubt about that. People are tossing balls across the wall of the unseen world, and somebody's tossing them back. But who? Uh, Ruth Montgomery thinks it's Arthur Ford. Bishop Pike thought it was Jim. A lot of people think it's Uncle Joe or Aunt Mary. How can we tell? Can our senses always be trusted? Is it possible that millions could be the victims of a giant cosmic hoax? Diane Pike, at the time she was consulting mediums, in an attempt to learn the whereabouts of her husband, made a very significant remark. She said, of course my husband and I both know that the information obtained through mediums is not always accurate. Is not always accurate. And Arthur Ford, who had talked about his spirit guide named Fletcher for years, once said with a wry smile, wouldn't it be amusing if what I thought was Fletcher all these years was actually my own subconscious dramatizing a purely clairvoyant experience? Bishop Pike was once asked if he ever considered the possibility that he might be involved with the world of evil spirits. He replied that the thought had crossed his mind, but that the thought was too disturbing and he had buried it. And so we ask, did Bishop Pike really talk with his son? Was Diane's vision genuine? Or was it a planned, polished, supernatural fantasy staged just for Diane? Did Arthur Ford really write the book? Did he know anything about it being written? And if he didn't write it, who did? Maybe we ought to know. I'll never forget a certain Sunday a number of years ago. It was just two days after that memorable Christmas Eve when 
the astronauts of Apollo 8 read the first chapter of Genesis, you remember? While they were orbiting the moon. On that Sunday evening, I was watching the Joe Pine show. Bishop Pike was a guest. Maybe you remember this particular one. The bishop was promoting his new book, The Other Side. And of course, they were discussing communication with the dead. Now, you may recall that Joe Pine was not always as courteous to his guest as he might have been. But on this occasion, he listened very attentively. And then finally turned to his guest and said quietly, Bishop, doesn't the Bible say somewhere that the dead know not anything? The bishop obviously was taken back, and he replied, I don't know. And he reached into his pocket for a pencil and said, I'll go home and look it up. A little later in, during that program, Joe Pine opened the show to questions from the studio audience, and the young man stood in the dock. What is your question for the bishop? Well, the young man required, replied, I don't have a question for the bishop. I just want to tell him where the text is that he doesn't know is in the Bible. It's in Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter, and the fifth verse. And then he quoted it correctly from memory. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Well, the verse that follows is also interesting. Notice, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. But evidently, all through his experience with the occult, the bishop did not feel it important to learn the Bible position on the matter. You'll recall that he was very perplexed about the haunting of his Cambridge apartment. I wonder what his reaction would have been if he'd returned to the flat one day and found in front of his nightstand a Bible open to the seventh chapter of Job. And verses 9 and 10 marked in red. It says, He that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house. But then the haunter of an apartment would hardly want to call attention to a scripture that says the dead don't come back to their houses, would they? Now, in the bishop's perplexity about what was going on in his apartment, you recall that he asked counsel of Canon Pierce Higgins and was advised to consult a medium. If, however, the bishop had turned to the Bible for counsel, the advice would have been strikingly different, especially if he'd come across Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. Isaiah 8, verses 19 and 20. In the wording of the Living Bible paraphrase, it says, So why are you trying to find out the future? By consulting witches and mediums? Don't listen to their whisperings and mutterings. Can the living find out the future from the dead? Why not ask your God? Check those witches' words against the word of God. He says, if their messages are different than mine, it is because I have not sent them, for they have no light in them. Really, friend, one gets the impression that God is, on not, very, is not on very good terms with the world of the occult. Wouldn't you say so? And it's difficult to get away from the startling statement that we read a moment ago, that the dead do not know anything. Now, certainly the dead would find it difficult to carry on any intelligent communication if they didn't know anything. But could this be just an isolated statement? No, evidently not. In fact, it seems to be consistent with the entire rest of the book. Surprising as this may be to the many who thought otherwise. An equally strong statement over here in um, Psalms. Psalm. 146, verse 4, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. According to this, when a man's breathing stops, so does his thinking. Was Jim Pike really hovering near and worrying about his father after he died? Was Arthur Ford chatting with a friend even before his funeral? Is Jack Kennedy, even now, 
working on some project somewhere? Is his peace being disturbed wherever he is by concern for his country and his brother Ted? If you ask the Bible, the answer is no. Over here in Job, Job 14.21, Job 14.21, he passes off the scene. He never knows it if his sons are honored or they may fail and face disaster, but he knows it not. He knows it not. Are the dead still alive somewhere? I think you see the problem that's shaping up. The Bible says no, but the nature of the psychic evidence seems to say yes. Ruth Montgomery is undoubtedly sincere. She's sincere in her belief that her book originated with Arthur Ford. What convinces her? The nature of the information. The information that only he would have at least so she believes. One individual after visiting a psychic said enthusiastically, when I, he saw that I had gone that, where I had gone that day and when I would be back, I knew then that he had a pipeline to God. How else could it be explained? That's the reasoning. You see, if the information is right, if it checks out, then there must be a pipeline to God. No other test is applied. There's no thought of checking these spirit messages by some dependable standard. To thousands of sincere minds, the thought has never occurred that something can be supernatural and still not be from God. Countless messages from the spirit world are accepted simply because they contain information that supposedly no one else but a loved one would know. What convinces Ruth Montgomery? The nature of the information. What convinced Bishop Pike? The nature of the information. What convinces the mediums themselves? The nature of the information. If it is information that no one else would know, then there must be a pipeline to God. A pipeline to the unseen world, yes. A pipeline to God? Not necessarily. Ruth Montgomery herself warns that there are what she calls mischievous and malevolent spirits on the other side. Then no question could be more appropriate than this. How does she know? How can she be certain that she herself has not been taken in by these very spirits against which she warns others? Impossible. Don't be too sure. Let me ask you, <clears throat> are you sure that no one else knows these family secrets? Are you sure that no one else knows those intimate details that seem to be so convincing? What about these mischievous spirits that Mrs. Montgomery talks about? If evil spirits are right here, out of our sight, but watching us all of the time, then don't you suppose they know some of the family secrets as well as we do? If there are impersonators in the spirit world and spirits are willing to lie, as psychics themselves admit, then do you see what could happen? Talented impersonators, plus unlimited information, plus willingness to lie, plus the cover of being invisible. Let me add to this just two brief statements of Scripture that strongly suggest that we're on the right track. 2 Corinthians 11:14. just a few words, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan masquerades as an angel of light, not with red skin, horns, and pitchfork, and a tail. Revelation 16, 14, this is revealing for there they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Devils working miracles? Do you see now that an experience may be supernatural but not be from God? That it may be a miracle and still be a fraud? Correct information doesn't prove a thing so long as mischievous, lying, impersonating spirits are lingering nearby. Messages allegedly from loved ones who have gone to their rest may mean only that somebody is running an answering service for the dead without their knowledge. 
And so if you toss a ball across the wall of the unseen world and it comes back with a family secret written on it, it doesn't necessarily mean that Uncle Joe tossed it back. It may only mean that spirits can write. How can we escape the conclusion that thousands today, it may be unwittingly, are playing games with the perpetrators of a giant cosmic hoax? I know I've raised a lot of questions today. There simply isn't time in a telecast like this to give you all of the answers from the Bible. But be sure to stay tuned at the close of this program. Our offer today will give you much more detailed information on this vital subject. Also, my new book, Psychic Roulette, is now off the press and on the public book counters. Be sure to pick up a copy at your favorite bookstore. This book contains amazing information about the games people play with the unseen world. Psychic Roulette on the public book counters. Friend, there is something going on in the unseen world, all right. There's no question about it, something dangerous. But there is more. A wise and loving God also operates in the invisible. And the loyal angels are there too, hidden from our sight. And there's a war on, a controversy raging between Christ and Satan, between good angels and evil angels. If you could draw aside the curtain, you could see them warring over you and your destiny. But the outcome of that battle over you is in your hands. You decide it, but God is there to help you. God is there to beat back the forces of evil when you want them beaten back. He's stronger than the enemy. God would sooner send every angel of heaven to your aid rather than to permit you to pass under the enemy's power against your will. But he expects you not to deliberately walk on dangerous ground. Is that too much to ask? Yes, friend, God is there. But you won't find him in the darkened room. You won't find him in the world of the weird. You won't find him in the rituals of the occult or the cold chill of the psychic world. God has other ways of speaking. He speaks through the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks through a cross. He speaks through the book he calls the Bible. You don't have to read it with the lights out. You, you can read it in the revealing light of day. And the more you read it, the more the truth will out, you see. Thank God, Jesus is not the prince of darkness. He's the light of the world. And one day soon he's coming back not in the eerie shadows of a darkened room, but in the blazing eastern heavens. Not in a spaceship, escorted by little green men, but in the vaulted skies, accompanied by his myriads of angels, the loyal ones, and in the sight of every man. He's coming to take us, if we're willing, to a land where all is light and darkness is gone forever. God forbid, friend, that when he comes, he should find us playing games with the unseen world. Shall we pray? Lord of light, Savior of men, God of the true and the loyal in the invisible realm, to you we commit our lives. We ask for protection. We ask for safety. Keep our feet from consciously or unconsciously moving on to forbidden ground. Save us from ourselves, from the subtle appeal of the counterfeit. Prepare us for the great day of your coming. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Well, today there's no question about what our gift for you should be. It just has to be my book, Destination Life. In this book, I have probed in detail the psychic world and life after death. That's our subject today, you see, that we've just introduced it. And it's such a big subject. The scriptures have so much to say about it. And of course, it's vital that we understand what is going on in the unseen world. We dare not make a mistake. A mistake in this area could be tragic. And so, destination life. Here are 92 pages of sound, but fascinating information that you can read over again and again at your leisure. 
There's comfort here for those who've lost a loved one. There's caution here to keep us away from dangerous ground. Then there are chapters about what the future holds, heaven and hell, what, where they are and what they are, the second coming of our Lord and what follows it, the future that God has in mind. Destination Life. Nearly well over a half million copies of this book in print around the world and in various languages as well. Now, of course, there's no cost at any time. Reach for a pencil now. We'll tell you how to request your copy. Please do ask for it, friend. It takes only a moment, but that moment could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. One reminder, if you write instead of phone, be sure to give the name of the book, Destination Life, so we'll know which one you desire. You see, we offer a different book every week, and we want you to have this one, Destination Life. Now, here is the information you need. Address your card or letter to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Could there be an easier address to remember? Just It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. It takes only a few moments to write, I say, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. Thank you for your calls and for your letters and for your financial support, which makes it possible for us to bring It Is Written to your area week by week. Now, did you write down the address? It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. One little feature about these books that you receive each week. Inside the back cover is a fold-out that describes all eight books that we offer. And it tells you how you may have other copies and how you may receive them, purchase them, for giving to your friends, family, and loved ones. This one particularly, I think you'll want to do that. Destination Life. Let me read the chapter titles. Appointment in Samara. That's my favorite. Beyond This Day. I've made a record on that. Beyond This Day is the chapter on comfort for those who've lost loved ones. The Trail of Intrigue and Psychic Cinerama. These really are just like today's message. Strange Altars, Cosmic Invasion. There's a telecast, word for word, with that chapter. Firefall, 38 Witnesses, and Destination Life. So the time has come all too quickly to say, Goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.